Well, John Lennox is an emeritus professor of mathematics and the philosophy of science at the University of Oxford. And his new book, Where is God in a Coronavirus World, has just been published both in paperback and digital format by the Good Book Company. And he's on the line from lockdown at his home to talk about it and about life in lockdown as well. John, welcome along. Great to see you. Glad to be with you again. Um, John, tell us a bit about what life in lockdown looks for you and Sally at the moment. How are you guys coping? Well, we're coping very well. It's wonderful. We're very fortunate to have a garden, of course, that we can get out into. And we have very kind neighbours so that we haven't actually had to venture out very much at all to do shopping and so on. It's a strange business, but we keep in touch with the family using video links and telephone and and so on. So although we're isolated, we're not completely cut off from the world. And you've been keeping yourself busy. I mean, you're you're busy normally anyway, but what does that busyness look like during this particular phase? Well, when it started, as you mentioned, I'm a mathematician. And although I never was much of a statistician, (laughs) I know enough about exponential growth And it struck me right at the beginning of this, this is going to multiply very rapidly and become a hugely serious threat around the world. And for some reason or other, I felt just inwardly impelled to sit down and try to write something. I wasn't uh, thinking at once of producing a book, but I thought I need to write into this. And so I did, and I sat down, worked all day long, and more than days long, so to speak, for a week, Mm. and produced this little book, Where is God in a Coronavirus World? It's extraordinary that you have turned it around so quickly. Um, Well, it's extraordinary that the Good Book Company, their their team is just phenomenal. Tim Thornborough has done an amazing job, Mm. and he's already got it translated into, I think, a dozen languages, so I find that's very hard to believe. It, it is extraordinary and and so good that modern technology allows for that to happen, but also for us to talk about it, you know, very that's quickly, correct, yes. quickly on the back of its publication. Um, so, so yes, so obviously it was the situation that you saw developing that caused you to want to write the book. Um, what sorts of questions does it answer ultimately, this particular book? Well, I would put it more modestly than that. I, I think this kind of issue, uh, a pandemic, it raises huge questions. And it recalls for me something on a much smaller scale, but nevertheless, the New Zealand earthquake when I mm. arrived in New Zealand just two or three days after it had happened. And people were asking all kinds of questions as to had it any significance or is this just another proof that atheism is true and we've got to accept it? Hard luck if we happen to be where it hits, and lucky for us if we aren't. Or uh, people were responding by saying this is a judgment of God, and uh, that wasn't helping too many people either. And uh, I suspected that exactly the same questions would come up, but there would be two dimensions to it, not just one. There'd be those who were more intellectually inclined, And they'd ask the big God questions, where is God and all of this? But there'd be other people who'd be emotionally very distressed. Mm. And we've seen that around the world. Loneliness in the self-isolation, grief, especially when you have to say goodbye to a loved one without being able to hug them or kiss them for the last time. That must be absolutely terrible. And psychiatrists and psychologists are talking about the danger of the continuation of this lockdown situation. So it concerned me both from an intellectual perspective and from a pastoral perspective. I think the and, pastoral perspective is is enormous and perhaps we're not really at the point just now where we're going to feel the full brunt of it. But my I wife think is, that I think that's right. Yeah. But to my, neglect that dimension and think yeah. this is just an intellectual problem mm, that we can mm. solve, I think 
is a serious mistake. Yeah, my, my wife uh, has just conducted a funeral, um, just five people, the maximum allowed at the crematorium, very much a, an in and out thing because they are experiencing obviously a surge at the moment. And she just came home and said, it was just so sad that we couldn't do those things we normally do, hugging, comforting, no touching of the coffin even. Uh, and and this is the reality, at least for the moment. And and it's there's almost uh, I had a, another conversation with N.T. Wright, and he said there'll there'll be a lot of displaced grief once things do normalise, and we should expect that in the future. Yes, uh, one of the things that struck me, and you may want to talk about it later, is that there's a wonderful story in the New Testament that handles both sides of this simultaneously. Mm. The famous story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now I can go into it briefly if you like. Feel free. Because it's, uh, you'll remember, and uh, many of our listeners will remember, Lazarus was ill. The sisters send a message to Jesus. He doesn't come and Lazarus dies. And of course, they knew he had the power to heal. And they also knew that he loved the family. So it raised the question, did he really love them? Did he really have the power to heal? These are the questions that are asked. And the two sisters were so different. When Jesus eventually came, Martha rushes out to meet him and she says, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. In other words, you're distant. Why, why did you isolate yourself? And this resonates with our situation today. Why is God in lockdown? Mm. Why didn't he come and do something? And Jesus says, your brother will rise again, which is enormously encouraging for people Christians in distress today. He didn't simply say Lazarus will rise again, but your brother, mm. the relationship in some way will be preserved and transformed. And uh, he said, well, he'll rise again. And Martha says, yes, I know that. I've been studying theology enough mm. to know there's going to be a resurrection. Now think about it. This is within four days of her brother's death. And she's asking deep questions about the resurrection the last day. And she got a big shock because Jesus then said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And I suspect she sensed something big was going to happen. And we can discuss that later. But what I want to come to is she then remembered her sister and fetched her. And Mary came out full of grief, full of emotion, sobbing and crying. And Jesus looked at this and saw what death had done to that little family. And he wept. Mm. And it seems to me that speaks volumes into the situation. There are many people that are watching us discuss today and they don't want detailed solutions about the resurrection. They want something to give them solace right now. Mm. And a touch, if only we could, or a hug, and weeping. Mm. And the fact that Jesus wept, I think, just shows the range of empathy he had with people who were in this little tragedy. And people say, but look, that's got nothing to do with the pandemic. My view is it has everything to do with the pandemic, because the suffering in a pandemic is the sum total of individuals suffering personal tragedies. And the Lazarus, Mary, Martha story, it seems to me, encapsulates this accurately. And so that's one of the little evidences to me that Christianity is actually true. It doesn't trivialize people's grief. I, I was going to obviously ask you about the different approaches you look at in the book. Um, there are different ways that different worldviews, if you like, deal with something like a pandemic, with the existence of evil in the world. I mean, firstly, you, you draw a distinction between moral evil and natural evil. Do you just want to explain what those two ideas are for those who aren't familiar? Yes, well, moral evil is the more familiar of the two, well, the bad things people do to one another. Natural evil is a very unfortunate expression because it uses the word evil, which has a moral connotation. What we mean by that is what C.S. Lewis called the problem of pain, mm. tsunamis, cancers, pandemics, earthquakes. That kind of thing where it seems as if human beings aren't necessarily involved at all. There's a fracture in nature. And it's very interesting that in the two places in the Bible 
that deal with this, both are mentioned virtually in the same breath. Job and his sufferings are very famous to people. And the attacks on his family came from, first of all, marauding uh, terrorists, basically. That's moral evil. But from fire and wind, knocking the house down. That's natural evil. But I think the most interesting thing for me has been going back to that story where Jesus was standing on the Temple Mount and a crowd said to him, you know, you realize what happened here, that Pilate came and massacred a number of people while they were offering sacrifices. That's moral evil. And Jesus then added to that. He said, yes, but there was another incident where the Tower of Siloam in Jerusalem fell on 18 people. That's natural evil. And then Jesus says, do you think they were sinners above all other sinners? Now, this is extremely important because when people look at these things, there's a judgmental danger comes in. And people say, that's the judgment of God. I think we need to be extremely careful mm -hmm. because the Lord himself made it perfectly clear that not all disasters like the Tower of Siloam falling are due to a particular group of people being worse than anybody else. I think that's such an important point. Uh, and obviously what Jesus says at the end of that passage as well is what's important is that we are all ready because death will come to us all in one form well, or another. That's exactly it. And that helps me focus. I, I've been thinking about that expression, except we repent, we shall all likewise perish. Mm -hmm. That it reminds me of Lewis, you know, saying that uh, we can put up a pleasure, but we can ignore it if we like, but pain is God's megaphone. He's mm. saying something. And I've noticed something, and it's this. If people say, this is the judgment of God, which I noticed in New Zealand very much, what I've observed is the reaction of others is not to think about God at all, but to think about the person that said that and said, you arrogant so-and-so, what right have you? to put yourself in the place of God and say, this is God judging. Whereas if we stand back from it and ask the question, what is this saying to us in general? And you've made the point yourself. Mm -hmm. It's telling us about our mortality and vulnerability. And one out of one of us is, is, <laughs> is going to die eventually. Mm -hmm. So that it would be much better to concentrate on that question, which then allows us to think, about where God stands in all of this, rather than be judgmental. I mean, to ram this in, it seems to me, people will then point, ah, but there were plagues in the Bible where God judged people. And I would say, yes, and Scripture tells us that. But so far as I know, Scripture has said nothing about COVID-19. Mm. So mm. I'm not going to say anything about it in this connection. It leads me to the next question, which is, but, but to what extent is God involved in creating at least the circumstances in which these kinds of viruses and things happen so there there are some theologies which will say god is if you like upholding sustaining and creating these sorts of natural evils if you like um and others that would say no um god is not directly responsible in some way for the disasters and, and calamity that befall so where do you land on those kinds of theological well, questions this is one of these huge theological problems that i've tried to discuss in one of my books determined to believe but looking at it straight it's clear if we believe that god is as i do the creator and sustainer of the world he has built the world as it is. And there are viruses in it. Most of them, by the way, are beneficial. And what's very interesting is they're utterly necessary for life. Mm. It's analogous to the situation with tectonic plates that cause earthquakes. They're utterly necessary for the preservation of the biosphere. So what I would say, and Connecting with it, the story that our Lord told about the Tower of Siloam, this is not God's direct causation. This is what can happen in the sort of world that God has built. Now, that leads, of course, to a further question. Why did he build it that way? Mm. Could God not have made a world in which fire warmed us but didn't burn us? Mm. 
and all those kinds of questions. And we've all debated, especially if we were ever students and burned the midnight oil, surely a good and all powerful God could, would, and so on. And it brings us back to David Hume's objection to these things, the Enlightenment Scottish philosopher saying, well, God can't be all good and all powerful at the same time, because if he was all good and all powerful, he'd do something about these things. Well, I've got two comments to make about that. If we wish we lived in a world where it was impossible for humans to commit moral evil, well, God could make automata, but there'd be no love in such a world. In other words, to put it bluntly, we're wishing ourselves out of existence. If there is to be the possibility of the things we value most in human relationships, then there must be enough freedom to allow choice, yes or no. Now, we can understand that to a certain extent, but it's fractured nature that's difficult. Mm. That is the problem of pain. And it seems to me that there's a deep connection. C.S. Lewis points this out. The Bible tells us, and of course it would demand a very lengthy conversation if ever we could get to the bottom of it, that moral evil originally entailed at some level or other damage to creation, that it would produce, to quote Genesis, thorns and thistles, and we could add to that pandemics, viruses, and all this kind of thing. So that in that sense, just as Jesus allowed Lazarus to die, it's God's permission that it happens, but not his direct command. God does not, says Scripture, tempt with evil. He doesn't cause it in that direct sense. So we're left with another question. And the other question is this. We never solve the philosophical problem. Could a God, should a God, would, etc., etc. And as a mathematician, I often think when you can't solve a question, why don't you ask another one that's related to it? And the other question I would suggest, and it's not an easy one, Justin, but I'll pose it anyway. It's any worldview that's worthy of the name or any religion has got to face the question that we're in a mixed world. I call it beauty and bombs or beauty and barbed wire, but I might as well call it beauty and COVID-19. We're facing a mixed picture. I looked up through my telescope the other night at the Orion Nebula and Venus, absolutely spectacular, and the moon because there's no pollution these days. And then I go inside and I see the um, intensive care units and hospitals and what's happening. It's beauty and COVID-19. Mm. We have to face that. So how do we face it? Well, my question now is this. Granted that it's like that, we all have to. Is there any evidence anywhere that there is a God that we could trust with it? Now, that's not an easy thing to answer. There are no simplistic answers to that. But it brings me, of course, as a Christian, straight to what has sometimes been called the, the suffering God. If Christ is God on a cross, what's he doing there? Well, he's not remained distant from human suffering, but has become part of it. And that gives me a way in that coupled with the resurrection leads me to say, I have no simple answers to this. But I think it can introduce you to someone who is the answer. There is, of course, going to be a number of atheists listening to this as yeah. well. And, and they may have another answer to the question. Well, they do. And, and that is simply, we live in a world where there is no you know, ultimate meaning to be grasped necessarily. There, there, there's no necessarily any ultimate justice. It is just the way it is, you know, as Richard Dawkins puts it, yes, there is no right. ultimate good or evil, right or wrong. Um, th there is just the universe we, that, that, that we observe and uh, it doesn't owe you, if you like, uh, anything good out of it. And, and, and that's a hard pill to swallow, maybe, but it's, a lot, it's the answer that a lot of people would give, simply that this is the world in which uh, diseases exist. Um, it's a natural world and we just have to put up with it. There's no silver linings necessarily 
And very often they'll hear the Christian message and feel like, well, that's just sort of a pie in the sky kind of, you know, it'll be okay in the end. Yes. And uh, Richard Dawkins puts it brilliantly and forcibly, and I've debated him on it. Um, And we need to take it seriously, Justin. Uh, The question that I want to ask is, yes, if that's true, we've got to face it. But is it true? Mm. And the same applies to Christianity. But I've got a whole host of difficulties with that view as such. First of all, it does solve the problem at a certain level, quite obviously, and some people are happy with that. It removes a problem. What I have noticed is the obvious. It doesn't remove the suffering. It does remove all hope. Now, if it's true, we just have to face that. But when we think of, well, think of the pandemic. Think of what is dealing with it. Hospitals, hospices, all of these things, they are part of a Christian legacy. And it seems to me that there's a prima facie case of listening seriously to a message that's rooted in history and experience and does actually give us hope. I have the problem because I'm a Christian. I still do believe in God, but I find the atheist solution unsatisfactory. Firstly, not simply it removes hope, which of course it will do if it's true, then that's it. But secondly, it leads to illogicality because people who are atheists still will call this an awful evil, oddly enough, and they'll make moral judgments about it. And that's very curious because if you go back to the piece that you almost quoted from Dawkins, <laughs> where he says this universe is just what you'd expect it to be if at bottom there's no good, no evil, no justice. And then he ends it by saying, DNA just is me dance to its music. So it's a deterministic world. Well, if there's no good and no evil, what are we doing talking about this as evil? A consistent atheist, hard atheist would have to say, well, there is no good, there's no morality and so on. But then what I notice is, Dawkins does believe in morality, and so do most atheists. And it brings me now to an intellectual question. Dostoevsky, I think, is the clue to this, and he knew about suffering. If there is no God, then everything is permissible. There's no morality, and yet we find ourselves to be moral beings. Now, we could go down the philosophical route, as you know, because you studied philosophy, and It seems to me in the end that atheism not only removes hope, but it removes morality. And I fear, now speaking more as a scientist, that it removes intelligibility because it assigns who and what we are to meaningless, mindless processes. And yet many atheists are doing very good science because they trust their minds. I don't think atheism gives them that right. And you know, in the back of all of this, I've spent a lot of time in atheist parts of the world, if you like to call them that, particularly Russia. And I will never forget a very uh, erudite scientist saying to me, you know, he said, We thought we could get rid of God and retain a value for human beings. And he said, we found out too late it was impossible. And that was, I've heard that several times Mm. from people over there, the value of human beings. And as we see the efforts being made by the health service, by, I mean, these are really brave people. And the nurses. it's, It's highlighted the fact that actually, ultimately, we do seem to have this, intrinsic value that we place on human life such that we're willing to allow the economy to tank in order to save potentially thousands of lives. That's exactly right and that points us away from atheism I would submit. It's an interesting one. Um, There's so many more things I'd love to talk to you about from this book John. It's uh, it it sparks so many thoughts in me. I I particularly was struck by another C.S. Lewis passage that you quote towards the end of the book um, in a section on maintaining perspective and you take uh, 
a segment that he wrote uh, on an article about nuclear weapons and living in an atomic age. And, and you sort of refashion it to say, well, what if we were to replace the, the atomic references with a pandemic and virus and so on? And, and it sort of comes out this way. Um, I'll just read a section of it that you quote here. In one way, we think a great deal too much of the coronavirus. How are we to live in a pandemic age? I'm tempted to reply, why, as you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year, or as you would have lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night, or indeed as you are already living in an age of cancer, an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the coronavirus was invented, and quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. We had indeed one very great advantage over our ancestors, anaesthetics, but we have that still. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the coronaviruses have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. Um, and it's in a sense, it's a, it's a tough passage. But I think what it did for me was remind me that in recent years in the West, we've been relatively cosseted against the kinds of things that, that humans have faced for millennia and which people have sort of accepted as part of the natural order of things, that they're not necessarily entitled to a pain-free life. And so I think that's partly why the coronavirus is causing so many people to stand up, because suddenly we're dealing with something that reminds us that we are mortal, that we, we can't control everything as we've been so used to doing in the West. Yes, I, I think Lewis was right. And it is, it's a very tough passage. But as I thought of it, and it's being spread around the internet, I thought how appropriate that is. You think of uh, people at the time of the Black Death or even earlier plagues that killed millions of people. The scale of those uh, pandemics was much greater, so far as we can see, than the current one. And it's very interesting that, I think it was in the plague of Justinian, that the Christians did great credit to themselves by not only looking after their own, but also looking after pagans who'd uh, fallen ill and weren't being treated by anybody. And getting a sense of proportion is not easy. And that's why I mentioned right at the beginning of our interview, the story of Mary, Martha and Lazarus. It was an atomic family, a little nuclear family. Mm. And all the issues are played out at that level. And so if this can act as God's megaphone, as using Lewis's metaphor again, and make us ask big questions about mor mortality, God and eternity, that would be a very important thing for it to do. I, I was going to say, as we start to draw the interview to a close, John, if you were willing to almost second guess what we might see providentially come out of this, acknowledging that you don't believe God, as it were, is directly causing the suffering. Nevertheless, you do believe in a God who redeems suffering. Um, what, what are your hopes for how this may change people, change the church, change the world even in due course? Well, my first hope would be a much deeper sense of gratitude to the brave people that are fighting this. Mm. I, I think this is hugely impressive. And I know they come from all kinds of, of worldviews, and we must respect them. The second thing is that I would hope that it would speak to me as a Christian to make me a more caring person, to realize and look out for the needs that people have, and not simply to help them as I try to on the intellectual level, but also to supply something that helps them on the emotional level. You see, the fact that Christianity helps people psychologically and emotional is not a proof that it's true, but it's what you would expect if it was true. And I think being much more conscious of the need to speak into our world because Time is short. Life is short. I'm in my mid-70s now, and I can hardly believe it. Mm. 
So in that sense, I don't have a great deal longer to go. So it gives what I might call an eternal perspective. We need to remember eternity as well as caring for the huge needs of the present. It's been really great to talk to you, John. Thank you very much for the time that you've given. Again, a reminder that the, the book is called Where is God in a Coronavirus World? It's published by The Good Book Company. I'll make sure that there are links from today's show, uh, from the video, where you can get hold of the book. It's uh, already available both in paperback and in a digital format, and even in other languages as well, we're told. So um, thank you so much, John, for taking the time to uh, make this book available. And I hope that it helps people wherever they stand on the faith spectrum with understanding and looking into these issues. Well, thank you very much for, as usual, Justin, asking superb questions and helping with a great interview. I really appreciate it.